Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Chris Jackson. I'm the Assistant Director of Admissions here at MSU Law. Uh, today, we are going to hear about the Indigenous Law Program at MSU Law. Uh, with me, I have Professor Matthew Fletcher and Professor Catherine Fort, um, who will talk, be talking about things. Um, so if you want to hold your questions until the end, we will have a question and answer opportunity for you to um, pose any questions you might have. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, my name is Matthew Fletcher. I'm uh, Professor here at Michigan State University College of Law and Director of the Indigenous Law and Policy Center. Um, been here since 2006. The center is uh, we start, the center started in 2003 or four thereabouts. Um, we are, have uh, two full-time faculty members, uh, tenure system faculty members who are part of the center in addition to myself. Uh, there's also Professor Winona Single. And um, <clears throat> you can look her up on online on faculty profile page. We also have Kate Fort, who's on the phone. She's the staff attorney and director of the Indian Law Clinic that we have. Oh, look, there's a the picture. So <laughs> thank you, Chris. So Chris is moderating this wonderfully. Um, we do a lot of things with our center. We have, um, in addition to just the regular doctrinal classes, we offer classes on federal law and Indian tribes. Uh, American Indian Tribal Law, we have a class on the Indian Child Welfare Act, a class on Indigenous Peoples and International Law, Comparative Law Perspectives, um, we have a class. We typically have, often have classes on Tribal Economic Development, we've had a class on Indian Gaming, off and on in the past. We also have the clinic, as I mentioned before, Kate Ford is the director of. Um, clinical students uh, and upper level classes can actually have clients. They actually uh, write briefs and pleadings and do legal research for real clients. Um, so there's a wide variety of uh, uh, activities you can engage in, academic activities. That all leads to, if you uh, choose to, to what we call the Indigenous Law Certificate. And that goes on your uh, transcript. Uh, the certificate program, there's a list of classes that we recommend you take. In addition to the Indian law classes, we want to make sure that you have the kind of well-rounded education to, uh, that is typical for the kind of work that Indian lawyers do. Um, and that's a lot of transactional work. That's a lot of uh, administrative processes, a lot of federal court litigation type work. Um, my background as a lawyer, I worked seven years in-house for Indian tribes, meaning I worked directly uh, at the tribal government building of various tribes that I worked for. Um, so as an in-house attorney, you are really what we call a generalist, meaning anything that comes through your door in a given day, you'll, you'll, be, you'll end up doing that kind of work. So I did participate in federal and tribal court and state court litigation. On, so on Monday, I might be doing that. On Tuesday, I might be in D.C. or Lansing lobbying uh, Senate Committee on Indian Affairs or the Governor of the State. On Wednesday, I might be back at the tribe participating in uh, tribal government uh, work groups with the tribal council, the tribal chairman, um, and the agencies of the tribal government. Um, Thursday, you might be in uh, negotiating with uh, the state over law enforcement cooperative agreements or tax agreements. And uh, Friday, you go home, you go back to the tribal government building and try to get a rest. <laughs> but that never really happened. So. Um, just as an overarching background on the practice of Indian law, 
about six or eight years ago, the Native American Bar Association did a survey and found about 2,400 people who are Indian people who are actually lawyers. About two thirds of those people are in the practice of uh, representing Indian tribes or are in the practice of Indian law in some way. And what that means is, given that the Indian people are already way underrepresented in the academic or the legal community, less than 0.2%, about 0.2% of all lawyers are actually Indian. Um, and the fact that there are 573 federally recognized tribes and 30 some states that have significant Indian country within them, the, the need for lawyers who have an expertise in Indian law is really quite dramatic. And um, one of the things that our certificate program is helpful for is not so much that we're giving you a education in Indian law, although that we certainly are doing that, but it's a indicator to prospective employers that Indian law isn't just some mere hobby of a student. It is actually something that the student is dedicated to. And we our, our students have gone on to work for all three branches of, the, of government, federal, state, and tribal. Um, they've gone on all sorts of different uh, work, uh, different kinds of work from litigation to transactional, governmental work, lobbying work, and uh, just a wide variety of opportunities. They're, we like to say that they're really, if you are willing as a graduate of MSC Law with our certificate, you're willing to travel, go anywhere, you will absolutely find a job in Indian country or working with um, Indian tribes or in tribal issues. So that's just a basic overview. Is there anything else you want me to add, Chris? Um, I don't know, uh, Professor Ford, do you want to talk a little bit about the clinical experience? Sure, the clinical experience, um, sorry, just checking, I'm not muted, <laughs> is, uh, like many other, we're part of the larger MSU Law Clinic, which is where students um, can, as Professor Fletcher mentioned, have clients. Um, different clinics at MSU include the Rental Housing Clinic or the Immigration Clinic. At the Indian Law Clinic, we represent tribes. Um, we, when we represent them in court, it's almost exclusively at the appellate level on Indian Child Welfare Act cases. Um, that means that we do a lot of research and brief writing on issues that are affecting um, American Indian families and children. And we practice around the country using a process called the Pro Hoc Vice, which lets us find local counsel and affiliate with them and then file our briefs. So right now our clinic is filing briefs in both Washington State and West Virginia using that process. We also when we're not doing uh, appellate work in child welfare, we're doing what um, Professor Fletcher often refers to as nation building, which is the support for tribal courts. So that includes everything from writing what we call bench briefs, which is an aid to a tribal judge summarizing a case, to writing bench books, which is an aid for a trial level tribal court judge in interpreting um, and running in running hearings and interpreting tribal law. And we also um, at times help draft uh, tribal law. We also do various levels of research and memo writing. Right now we're working on a project to help a state um, develop their own India state law on Indian child welfare. And so I'm editing a document that surveys and compares all of the state Indian Child Welfare Act laws around the country and a student is doing that work right now. So those are just some examples. Uh, we also do a fair amount of work actually, the other area we do a fair amount of work in is environmental law, um, assisting tribes on a, uh, a number of different areas from wild rice preservation to um, appealing mining permits um, and research uh, to support um, tribal interests and voice in environmental areas. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, so I, uh, 
ask Professor Fletcher to talk a little bit about um, what student experience is like in the classroom um, and uh, what it's like on campus for um, Indigenous students. And I know Professor Ford, you probably can add some of that as well. So, thanks, Chris. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're located in uh, an area of uh, the United States that is known as Anishinaabe Key to Indian People. It's where the Anishinaabe people. Uh, the Ottawa, Potawatomi, and Chippewa tribes uh, hail from this area. Um, this, we're within the treaty uh, ceded area from the Treaty of 1819. Um, Ojibwe tribes primarily in the southeast and uh, you know, Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe also uh, ceded this territory to the United States way back in the day. Um, this is uh, Michigan State located um, in an area that is uh, pretty was pretty heavily uh, populated by native peoples uh, and still is really uh, to be frank um, so we have uh, in a given year I would say um, you know several tribal members are come to campus and begin the, their careers as 1Ls we, we tend to graduate several every year um, and in a given year we might have 20 to 30 tribal members who are enrolled in our law school in some one, one of the three years of law school um, they're pretty good at organizing uh, through the Native American Law Students Association, and uh, which uh, is a pretty robust, uh, a busy group. And both here on campus and nationally, a lot of our students uh, go to national meetings like the National NALSA Moot Court Competition and also to the uh, big Indian Law Conference that happens in the Southwest every year in April. Um, and become uh, elected representatives at the national group, the National NALSA group. So uh, the students are really very busy. We have speakers on campus quite regularly. Um, the Indian Law Program runs a, a conference every fall, usually in October or November, um, that uh, where we bring in about 100 to 150 practitioners and, and students and academics from here and elsewhere to talk about Indian law issues. We coordinate that with the Tribal In-House Council Association. So when you're on campus, if uh, you're a native person, you come on, you will, you will uh, first thing that will happen is that you will be in a immersion week class that's uh, typically just basically an orientation type class. Um, I'm one of the three professors who runs that, or runs that group and we have a, a lot of Indian law right there in the first week. So even if you don't like Indian law, you're going to get Indian law anyway at Michigan State, and that's just part of what we, uh, that's part of the practice, that's a part of the, the culture of this university and the fact that this really is, um, and it's an acknowledgement that this is Anishinaabe key where we are, the world is Anishinaabe people. So um, you'll, your first year of law school will be classes that are typically called the common law classes or mandatory classes that everybody has to take. Um, you know, classes like contracts and constitutional law, administrative, regulatory state, that sort of thing, a legal writing class. So you won't have so much Indian law in there, but there will be a little bit. Um, your second and third year, you get to choose electives, and we strongly recommend you take classes that tip, will tend to be on the bar exam, things uh, like um, criminal procedure and legal ethics, I think is mandatory. I teach that as well and uh, evidence, stuff like that. But your opportunity then is to be in smaller classes that are a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more uh, specialized. So that's when you can take uh, our, our Federal Indian Law Survey, which is called Federal Law and Indian Tribes, and the student called LIT. Um, those are what's the, uh, that class is a lot of fun, and uh, anybody can take it. Uh, it runs the gamut of uh, legal and American history, constitutional law, administrative law. Um, there's a lot of, uh, it's all Indian law but cases and frankly the history of Indian law in the United States, history of Indian tribes in the United States is not all that great as many of you probably already know, um, but there is a lot to learn. There's a lot of really interesting uh, concepts that are unique to Indian law that you're not going to see in a lot of other um, classes here in the law school and plus we do our best to run a really relaxed classroom. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to simulate, um, you know, actual practice type scenarios, 
um, we have a lot of opportunity for participation of students. The classes are, like I said before, are relatively small, so we uh, spend a lot of try time trying to make the class actually uh, useful as a, what you will actually get in, in practice. Uh, in particular, in the other class, like the American Indian Trouble Law class, pretty much is all simulation. So um, you are going to find out, at least in sort of a simulated atmosphere, exactly what the practice of law might be in a given day um, if you do work uh, in Indian law. Um, what else is there to add, Chris? <laughs> more suggestions? Uh, I don't know. Did you have anything to add, Professor Ford? Um, uh, no, that about covers it. Okay, great. Um, so with that, I mean, that kind of covers some of the topics I was hoping to cover today um, with this, but now we're going to open it up for questions, because uh, I think that's some of the most important parts of these webinars, is being able to have your questions answered real time. Uh, so if you uh, scroll to the top of your screen, you'll actually see a little box that says Q&A. If you click on that, uh, you'll be able to type in a question and answer um, that you might have, or a question, we'll give you the answers, hopefully. <laughs> Um, and so if you want to ask anything um, to our panel or faculty, please feel free. Uh, while you're also doing that, I'm going to pull up our contact information for our office. So if you do have additional info, um, you're able to reach out and contact us, um, or we can even connect you with our faculty members as well. Well, while we're waiting for questions, um, and please uh, feel free to interrupt or uh, craft your questions anytime, and I'll try to get to them. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that uh, our alums have done. Like I said, we've been around uh, since 2003 or 4, um, and we've had several dozen alums go through the program and, and get pretty interesting jobs. We've got several people who are federal prosecutors, so um, they, they work for the United States Department of Justice, which is the biggest law firm in the United States, the most powerful law firm in the United States, so to speak. So technically their job titles are assistant U.S. attorney, uh, and they prosecute, uh, mostly they prosecute Indian country crimes. We've got people in the Upper Peninsula here in Michigan. Um, but we also have people that um, come from around the country. A lot of our students, our, our native students, come from all over the place. So. Uh, we've got uh, alums in places like the District of New Mexico. They work out of Albuquerque doing Indian country and other major crimes. Um, you know, we've had people over the years in Montana, Wyoming, uh, working in, uh, yeah, uh, for U.S. Attorney's offices. So that's a, a pretty, I, I, always, I always start with that because that's more of a really impressive kind of job. It's not everybody uh, can be a, a federal government uh, attorney. So. I always found that pretty impressive. We are, actually have an alum, probably our most prominent alum, who is uh, on the actual board for the law school and is also the chairman of the Bay Mills Indian community. But before uh, he ran for public office, uh, he worked here in town as a lawyer for a big law firm uh, in Lansing, and then from there moved on to uh, working in D.C. in the Obama administration for the uh, Department of Interior, high-level positions, that, and at times he was actually the guy who was making all the major decisions on behalf of the federal government in relation to Indian gaming nationally. Um, and did all of that with uh, an MSU degree. So I think that uh, shows that there really is no limit to what law students who go through our program can do. We have a lot of people who have gone to work in-house for Indian tribes. I think that's a job that's uh, critically important, maybe the most important job in Indian country. I know I'm biased because that's what I did as a practitioner, but in-house counsel for Indian tribes, you really run the legal practice for that entire tribe. And, uh, you know, you get to see your clients pretty much every day, even if you don't want to see them, you get to see your clients. And that's not always the case. If you go work for a big firm or a government job, um, you are going to have an enormous amount of client contact. You're going to have an enormous amount of discretion and frankly, power to decide um, and to advise the client on, on massive legal issues. As in-house counsel, I, got, I had an opportunity to participate in the, uh, negotiations over taxes and bond financing for many dozens of millions of dollars a couple of different times. I had the opportunity to 
argue in tribal, federal, and state courts on various issues and mass litigation that, that we that I was involved in, the tribe was involved in, my client. Um, I had the uh, opportunity to testify. It wasn't my most favorite experience, but testify in front of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs um, and to write testimony for the client on that. Uh, and House Resources Committee, and on occasion, we've had an opportunity to write even here in Lansing, some material, some legislative, uh, not legislative material, lobbying materials. Um, done an enormous amount of work in terms of helping craft, as in house council, helping craft the legal uh, infrastructure of Indian tribes. So, you know, if a tribe has some issues with um, child welfare, it needs to have a law, it needs to have a code to, uh, to, to make those decisions. Uh, what happens to kids that are in need of care, and the tribe needs to make those decisions. They have to have a, a rules and standards which to apply. So many of our alums have gone to work in house and tribes around the country, uh, Washington State, California, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, and certainly here in Michigan and all over the place. Um, again, our students come, our, come from, a, we, we draw from a national pool of students. Yeah, so we have a couple questions have come through, so we'll go ahead and start answering those. Uh, so the first question is, how well received are white attorneys in Native American tribes? Are there any roadblocks um, that they might face? Uh, you know, what I, first of all, you got to start with the proposition that there are way few, not nearly enough Indians to actually fill these positions. There's probably only about 1,500 Indian people that actually want to work uh, and do Indian law, maybe a little bit more than that, and I would say there's that's probably less than 20% of the actual job market for Indian law. So um, there's plenty of work. Uh, Non-Indian lawyers are absolutely in demand. Um, and we've never really had any serious trouble finding uh, jobs for our non-Indian uh, alums who've gone through the program. And we were certainly happy to help them uh, find a job and we're usually pretty, very successful. That said, um, you know, there is Indian preference and employment for most uh, tribal organizations, uh, Indian tribes, so they're going to look for non-Indian, or Indian lawyers first, um, and it's very possible they won't, that a given tribe won't be able to find one. Uh, and they will absolutely look for non-Indian lawyers. They are very welcome in Indian country. Anybody who does good work is going to be rewarded for, um, for, their, for their work. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And, um, you know, it's a, uh, to be frank, it's, a, it's, a, it's the practice of law is an adversarial pra uh, profession, and so um, there are going to be times where a tribal client in particular might want to have, uh, specifically have an, uh, a non-Indian lawyer to be that uh, to be that advocate. So that is uh, usually not a problem at all. Uh, did you have anything you want to add to that uh, question, Professor Ford? Well, I think you covered it. I think it's important. I'm not, uh, I'm white. I'm not native. Uh, I think it's important to always be aware of that fact. Um, and at a recent um, presentation I was at, they actually used, I learned the phrase cultural humility, which I think goes a long way in explaining sort of how you yourself can carry yourself as a non-native attorney when you're working with tribal clients. Great. Thank you. Uh, so the next question we have is, what seems to be the most pressing legal issue to indigenous tribes currently? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't say there's just one. Remember, there's 573 tribes. So if you ask the Alaska tribes, uh, the 229 of them, uh, you're going to get a wide variety of answers. Um, you know, but here in Michigan, we have every tribe has issues with, um, you know, that may be rise to the priority in that moment. It could be. Uh, one month it could be Indian gaming, the next month it could be the exercise of hunting and fishing treaty rights, uh, the next month it could be Line 5 or other pipelines or environmental uh, uh, issues that arise in any country, environmental justice issues. Um, the month after that it might be an Indian child welfare situation. Um, so the, it's hard to say what the most pressing priorities are, but I can give you a sense of uh, nationally, the things that tend to rise to the top of the of the heap tend to be environmental related things. 
um, mo the vast majority of Indian tribes are very concerned about climate change. They're the ones on the sort of the edges of the world, so to speak, literally, and they are the ones who are getting hit the hardest with um, climate change impacts right now, and want to do highly motivated to do everything they can and to influence and also themselves to to correct that and push some of that back. And then there are plenty of tribes, maybe not as many on the environmental side, who are really interested in natural resource extraction. So um, there's that. Um, nationally, there's a huge case pending that's really consumed us here at Michigan State because our Indian Law Clinic really is handling the, the appellate defense of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And there's a massive case coming out of Texas right now that really is shaking that uh, the Indian Child Welfare community to the core. So we're going to be working on that for the next several years at the very, late, at the very least. Um, uh, so what, other than the environment and Indian child welfare, there are always uh, issues relating to just uh, taxes, um, Indian gaming, any kind of tribal economic development activity, uh, relationships with tribes and local governments and the state governments and the federal government. Um, but, but the big ones right now, I think, are the, the environmental, climate change type things, uh, which can come up with Standing Rock, they can come up with Line 5 in Lake Michigan here, they can come up with Bears Ears in the Southwest, um, or you have, you have these massive gold mines in Alaska that are, um, are, are you know, being approved right now. So that, all that uh, environmental stuff is really huge. And in child welfare is really huge. Um, and whatever, Cases come up to the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court, and there's usually a few of them every year. Um, those tend to attract the attention of um, Indian country as well. Great. Uh, did you have anything you'd like to add, Professor Ford? No, that's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I haven't received any other questions, so if anybody has any other questions, if you can go ahead and uh, let us know real quick, we'll get, try to get those answered for you. Um, while we wait for any additional questions, I'm going to go ahead and pull up our list of upcoming webinars that we have for the rest of the fall semester. So you'll see some that we have um, about some of the programs we have here at MSU Law, but also more generally about just applying for law school. So for those of you who might be looking at applying this year, uh, some of those might be pretty beneficial um, for me to uh, take part in. Um, so not seeing any additional questions, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up for the day, um, unless either of our panelists have anything to add. Um, I'd like to thank you both for participating. Um, if anybody has any questions that's um, out there listening today, um, and maybe you weren't able to attend live, please feel free to send us questions at our email or give us a call in our office, and we can always set up a chance for you to talk with one of, of us in the admissions office, or uh, send along your question to our faculty to try to get an answer for you. So. Uh, with that, thank you everyone and I hope you have a great day. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.